speaker tonight is uh, uh, a hero of the local variety. Uh, his name is Mr. Thomas Reese. Mr. Reese was an 18-year-old infantryman. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, sent to the Philippines um, and this, uh, uh, first to the island of Luzon and later to the island of Mindanao. Um, he has a number of stories to tell about his exploits and about his near misses with, uh, with death. I think this guy is a charmed guy, so you may want to see what lottery numbers he'd like to suggest that you you pick. Uh, interesting, when I was a kid, uh, I was about 12 years old, I lived in the Philippines with my uh, parents. My dad was in the service, and we lived at, uh, um, at Clark Air Force Base, um, which, by the way, got you know, covered with soot from a, uh, earth, from a volcano that erupted uh, and covered the entire base up to about 12 feet full of ash. Uh, that was after I left. But uh, uh, I loved the Philippines. It was, you know, wonderful for a kid to be there because it had the remnants of the war, and it was all just John Wayne and fun. You know, I don't think that's exactly what uh, Tom went through, but uh, uh, it is kind of a, make a neat connection. So without any uh, reserve, we'll go to Tom. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. One of the gentlemen in the audience here reminded me of a good starting line. This whole thing that I'm doing and I've been aware of for about the last year is because I was a grandpa. And I was looking for ribbons and medals that I'd had 62 or 63 years ago and hadn't seen hide or hair of them for many years. I wanted to leave something for my grandchildren, two boys. And so I started the search, and there wasn't anything in my house that vaguely resembled a, a patch or metal or anything like that. So I decided I would call around, and I happened to be in the library that they were using uh, when this was built, and met a fellow by the name of Burns. I had decided to read all of Tarzan's books the last time before I died. I'm 82 years old, and I probably would be one of the last remnants of the Battle of Mindanao, which was the very last battle of the war. <clears throat> In looking for medals and ribbons and that sort of thing, I, there was a place right over here, the Veterans Building. Uh, that's the place where I started. And I walked in, and two nice ladies standing there very helpful. And I said, told them what I was looking for, and they said, well, maybe we can help you. So one of them took off and went back somewhere in the back rooms, came back about five minutes later and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Reese. But she says, all of your records were burned up when the war protesters, the Vietnam War protesters, burned the building down. This was sort of hard for me to take because all I had was a little plastic thing about this big, you could hardly read. And they took it and did their best to try to decipher it out. That they could tell what kind of medals I was going to give my grandchildren. I had no recollection myself, 62, 63 years later, uh, about what I'd earned, what I, uh, what I had gone through, and so on. So anyway, on my way over there uh, for the second visit to ask some more questions, I ran into two gentlemen coming out. And they were in uniforms of sorts. And I introduced myself and found out one of them was the uh, owner of a Waite funeral home, Mr. Waite himself, and the retired chief of police. 
And I said, how do you get started and what you're doing? She said, oh, we, we'll give you a card and you can fill it out. Uh, we meet the third Monday night of every month. And that's what I'm wearing here now, the American Legion. <laughs> that's how I got started just a year ago. After 62 years of doing relatively nothing in, except watching parades and that sort of thing. <coughs> Excuse me. I have in my lifetime uh, came within a hair of being dead 15 times. I'd like to do, if I might, just go through these and then you can a ask questions you'd like when I get completely through it. When I was five years old, I was a little boy in Middletown, Ohio, living in my grandfather's house with six of his daughters, of which my mother was one, and my brother, myself, and him, there was nine of them, all sharing this uh, <coughs> restroom and so on, and he was working and so on. This was a middle, about the middle of May, and it was hot, steaming in uh, Middletown, Ohio. And I was the only one in the whole neighborhood that wasn't either in school or working. This gave an opportunist rapist an opportunity to get acquainted with me, lead me back into the, the alley, pretending he had marbles he wanted to show me. I grabbed hold of my wrist and took off towards a grade school, went around the front and into some bushes. He had a switchblade knife, which he opened up, and he said if I made a sound, he cut me. And things proceeded. This must have been about four or five minutes later, and all of a sudden, to the left, I could hear, and he could hear, a woman's clickety-clack as her leather shoes hit the sidewalk, coming right down past us about eight feet away. He must have made an arrow about his knife and made it flash because it attracted her attention. She turned around and looked me right in the eye. And all of a sudden it re she realized what was happening. She jumped about two feet off the, off the ground, pointed at him and hollered out, what are you doing over there? And she hollered and screamed. All the windows in the grade school were open. People started screaming and hollering, shut up. And a guy pulls up in the car and slams his door open and comes running up. And this creep, this character, decided he'd had enough. Closed his knife, started to run, and of course he tripped because his pants were down. Landed flat on his face, pulled his pants up and disappeared around the building. The girl walks up to me and she looks at me and she says, do I know you? And she said, are you all right? And I said, I think so. And she lifted me up and uh, stood me up, put my clothes back on, and said, I know who you are. She said, you're a little Tommy Reese, Roos nephew. I said, yeah, we'll live right over there at 707 Marietta Avenue, about two blocks away. So she escorted me home, went through the back door, and uh, my Aunt Ruth came running out, wondering what was going on. And this woman told her all about it. We went in the house, locked all the windows and all the doors, and she called my grandfather. He only worked about six blocks away, and it wasn't long until I could hear his Ford come roaring around the corners and squealing his tires, running into the house and asked. I was sitting on a, a stool in the living room, and first thing he asked is, are you all right, Tom? And I said, I guess so. <coughs> he questioned me in detail, and then got on the phone and called the police. And the chief of police came on the phone. He said, I think I know who this rascal is. I think he works for the uh, dry cleaning establishment right across from where the little boy said this happened. He said, I'll meet you over there, my grandfather, he said. So my grandfather took off, and he was coming out the back door when they got there. I won't tell you too much, except he was in the hospital in almost three months what my grandfather did to him. This was a one of the way of starting your life with lots of horrible things happening to you. But when you're five, you don't remember him very, very well. About four months later, I came down with strep throat and diphtheria. And I was breathing my last when the doctor got there. 
And he gave me a shot in the back that uh, made me scream, but did the job. And I spit out all this stuff out and recovered. So that's the second. Dr. Clark saved my life then. The third thing that happened when, after I moved to Dayton, Ohio with my brother and my mother, I was coming home from the YMCA where my brother and I were quite good swimmers. Walking down some steps, there was a water building right here, and as you stepped out into the street, zoom, 70 mile an hour car, was just missed hitting me and put me in heaven for sure. So that's number three. Then the war came out, and my mother was hoping that I'd be too young to get in it, but I wasn't. And when I was 18, I was drafted, sent to Camp Atterbury first, and then wound up over in uh, Roberts on the coast, and took basic training and heavy weapons, water-cooled, and 80 mortars. Uh, this about the, a few weeks before uh, the Battle of the Bulge started and other outfits on the training were called home for a short leave and put on a boat and shipped right over there and got in on it. Many of them didn't live through it. This was the beginning of my career in the, in the service. Uh, <clears throat> we, luckily for us, uh, were gonna go the other way, uh, the South Pacific. So I was sent home on a nine day leave and came back to, uh, to this uh, shipping point and uh, got all my shots, got on board of a troop ship and headed for the South Pacific. Our first stop, the first stop for this boat, all 4,800 of us, were as replacements for people dead and wounded uh, because the battle had already started in Leyte. And they put it, all of us in squad tents, 12 men per squad. For some reason, the guys in my tent didn't get called, uh, didn't have anybody talk to them. All we do is eat and come back, eat and come back, eat and come back. For 11 straight days, we did this until the 12th day came around, the colonel came walking up to the, our tent and called us out in front. And he said, I'm sorry, boys. We couldn't tell you anything because it could have really been a catastrophe. He said, one of your members came down with the measles and we had to quarantine you guys in your tent. <laughs> you know, by that time, some of my friends on board the boat were coming back in body bags and arms and legs missing. Uh, the next day, I thought, well, we're probably going to get our marching orders now, after all this time, uh, delaying for 11 days and not knowing what was going on, when another colonel came over and uh, said, any 18-year-olds in this tent, please follow me. And there were about six of us. So we went over and sat and I waited because my last name was Reese, like the peanut butter cup. I was the last guy. And he called me in and I uh, saluted and sat down. He said, uh, looked me right in the eye and he said, Miss Private Reese, he says, you're not supposed to be here. What do you say to something like that? After all this stuff you've gone through on board that boat, all that training almost got into battle boards. And I said, sir, he said, there was an act of Congress about the time your boat was going underneath the, the Golden Gate Bridge, that no more 18 year olds would be shipped overseas. And no more 18 year olds, if they're over there, were to, to have combat assignments. And so he started asking me, can you type? No. Can you do this? No. Can you do that? I finally stopped him and I said, Kerner, I've done all this, and I've done all this training to do a job, and I said, just as soon go wherever I was supposed to go originally. He said, I'll salute you on that, and I was sent back to the tent, <coughs> and uh, the next day we got our orders, and instead of winding up in Leyte, where there's still fighting going on, we were pre-shipped to Mindanao, which had just started, and they needed recruits there too. So we're on a big old LCT and uh, LCI, I guess it was, and came into Mindanao. Mindanao was the hottest, the most God-fearing <laughs> hellhole, excuse me, uh, that I'd ever been on and ever hoped to be on. 
It was right 300 miles from the equator, something like that. And it was just loaded with mosquitoes and heat and mosquitoes and heat and heat, <laughs> slapping and everything. I got on a truck <coughs> with some other guys that came off the LCI and we drove back into the jungle. When suddenly we stopped and uh, there was a deep voice off to the left says, is there anybody here from Ohio? And I was. So I said, yes, sir. Don't, don't say yes, sir. You're going to get me killed for sure. Come on over here. We got a bunch of Ohio guys here like to talk to you. So I did. And so for an hour or two, we shot the bull a little bit until finally uh, they, uh, they all left except the sergeant. He said, uh, where are you from in Ohio? I said, Dayton. He said, that's funny. That's strange. That's where I live. He says, what street did you live on? I said, McPherson. And he said, I'll be. He said, I live right around the corner at McDaniels. How can you ever figure on going through all of that and winding up with the first sergeant who lived around the corner? <laughs> sort of funny and humorous at the same time with that. And it, this, again, saved my life. I'm, I, to this day, I thank that God for that sergeant. Because he said, I'll tell you what, he said, I've been over a couple of years and I'm about ready to go home. He said, one of the things I'm going to make sure, since you live right around the corner from me, is that you know how to take care of yourself. He said, I'm going to make you my runner. And I'm going to teach you everything you have to know to stay alive. And he did, and I did. <laughs> <coughs> Towards the end of the war on Mindanao, uh, there were a lot of things happening. Uh, we had pushed the Japanese all the way up in the mountains. They were starving to death. We had food and they needed it. So a lot of, they began to give up. Uh, we began to take some prisoners. Before that, they'd walk around out with a hand grenade in their jock strap and, and blow all of you up. Anyway, does that sound familiar to what's happened today? Anyway, it was just about over and I pulled guard duty and my guard duty took me back and forth around this fence. On the other side of the fence were Japanese prisoners. I was walking my beat, and all of a sudden I heard this voice say, uh, soldier, soldier. And I looked over, and this Japanese guy standing on the other side of the fence. So I walked over, and I said, what is it? And he said, I've been over here for two years. He said, my folk don't know whether I'm alive or dead. He said, we know that the war is over. Would you mind, I hear that you're going to Hanshu Island and Okayama, which is the town, uh, for, for occupation. And I didn't know it. <laughs> Nobody told me about it yet. So uh, he, he wrote this Japanese stuff on a script, and I have put it in my pocket. And sure enough, a couple months later, we got on a... Uh, landing craft and landed in on Hachim Island in Okayama. For a couple of weeks, you know, we were so busy getting settled that I didn't even think about this. Nope. But all of a sudden I realized that and I said, oh my goodness, I was supposed to see his folks. So I got a couple of folks, with uh, guys with me, and we went out in Okayama trying to find his house. And we finally found it, and I knocked on the door, and the door opens, and guess who's on the other side of the door? the Japanese soldier on the other side of the fence. <laughs> How are you ever going to figure it? Just a few months ago, but before that, we were shooting and killing each other. And here I am standing there, handing him a note that he handed me a couple of months ago, clear over in, the, in Okayama, I mean, clear over in Mindanao. So anyway, he, said he was so overcome, and Japanese are very overcoming type of people. He said, my brother just opened a steakhouse. He said, I'd like to invite you and your three friends over for a steak dinner. And I did. I thought that was uh, something nice that you can know that wars don't always produce horrible villains. There are nice people on the other side sometimes. The, uh, the other thing that happened to me during I, the time in the battle in Mindanao, as soon as the sergeant left, of course, I wound up carrying a couple of uh, canisters of machine gun bullets because that's what I trained in, a light machine gun and, and 
in the Camp Roberts. I uh, wasn't long until I was uh, second gunner, and it wasn't long until I was first gunner, because guys were getting hit and killed and wounded. <coughs> the, uh, the thing I can remember the most, which should never have happened, while I was a runner of this sergeant, he sent me over across the, the uh, way to take a note to somebody, to the captain, I guess. And uh, when I came back, we could hear artillery explosions, ours. And all of a sudden, six big 155 landed right in the middle where I stood two minutes before and killed about eight or nine guys, wounded about 10. And I can still hear that medic screaming and hollering, cursing John L. Lewis because they were on strike and they need, we needed the barrels on those guns to keep this from happening. Just a little negative thing about sometimes you think you're doing things well for your fellow and you're causing somebody to get killed across the ocean. There was another instance uh, in combat when a friend of mine, and we called him Oki because he's from Oklahoma, of course, and uh, he had some funny idea about combat. Uh, we just came, came out from our foxholes and uh, we're walking across this field of corn and uh, beat up branches and stuff like that when we heard boom, 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 six mortars going off. There's knee mortars. And they made a lot of noise when they, the end of it hit the ground or hit something. And the sergeant hollered, hit the dirt. And so we all hit the dirt except Oki. And Oki stood there like this, perfectly still. They were on their way. We knew they were who they were shooting at, too. And boom, 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 boom. All six of them landed all in between us. And Oki still standing there, didn't get a scratch. None of us, none of us got scratched either. And there's one of those life-saving moments when Somebody's trying to kill you, they didn't do too good a job at it. We were fighting uh, in Mindanao uh, some of the toughest uh, Japanese, the, the Japanese Marines. They had to be six feet to get in it, and uh, they were ferocious fighters. The war years were soon over. I came home. and got some leave and came into Middletown, Ohio, which is where I, I was sort of brought up. And my Aunt Helen, who was married to uh, uh, Uncle Lou Keller, says, uh, Uncle Lou would like to talk to you. He's just sitting with, waiting for you in the backyard. So I said, okay. So I went into the backyard and there was a, my Uncle Lou sitting there. And he says, Tom, I got something to tell you. He said, I was over in the South Pacific too, like you. I said, I didn't know that. He said, yeah, I was on Leyte. And I said, I didn't know that. He said, one of the reasons was, he said, my job was to sort through all of the replacements coming in and put them where we needed them the most. And he said, can you imagine what happened to me when my little nephew's papers came across my desk? What do I do? He said, I held those things for two days and I finally decided not to play God anymore and let him go on through. I still think that he was a measle guy. <laughs> the reason we didn't get sent anywhere for 11 days, but he would never admit it or never talk about it after that little party day. Well, I think that pretty much sums it up. Uh, I spent a year in uh, Japan at, at <clears throat> when, during the occupations. There were a lot, there were some funny things that happened there, but there were also some sad things. By that time, I had taken a course in radio code in high school, believe it or not, back in Dayton, Ohio. This served me well, because uh, on the bulletin board one day, it said, anyone that has radio code experience, please retort to Sergeant so-and-so. So I did, and so he said, did I, did I, did? I said, yes, sir, R, R, R. <laughs> Anyway, if you know the radio codes, you know that did audit is a R. He says, 
we would like for you, we're really shorthanded because a lot of guys sent home uh, right after <coughs> we came to Japan. He said, so he sent me a oh, special training program to relearn the Morse code. It was a sad experience one night. Uh, it woke me up about 2 o'clock in the morning, wanted me to bring my radio, got in a Jeep with an ambulance in front of us, and went, went. I so wonder we didn't all get killed. But all night, just about seemed like it was all night that he was following this Jeep where I was sitting in the back seat until we got to this uh, little Japanese place and got out. And uh, the captain walked out, the company captain walked out and he said, sorry, well, he said he passed away about an hour ago. We were trying to get there in time to save the life, excuse me, instead of being shot or anything, he was driving a Jeep with his girlfriend and he hit a bridge of the Threw him out. I guess it must have broke his neck or something. He lived for a little while. Uh, the, the, the girl survived, but that was sort of a sad experience. To have, this guy went through all that, a lot longer than me, and to have to die that way. But life, you never know about. Back from the war, back into civilian life, When I was a student at George Williams College in Chicago with the YMCA, I put enough money together to buy an old clunker. And it was a lot easier than standing on that streetcar with all those people trying to get to a, a part-time job with the YMCA. So anyway, I did. And uh, another sitting in the cafeteria one day, and a young guy walks up. Says, Later on, I, this, my best friend, his name was Jim Livey. And he said, here, uh, the Jew and I walk, worked in the same YMCA. He said, you mind if I hitch the ride for you? He said, I'll buy you some gas. I said, oh, sure, OK. So I met him <coughs> uh, at the door, and we hopped in my car, and we went off to work. Uh, the YMCA was called so the Southern YMCA. We no more and got inside, and I, I in my bathing suit. And he was working with a high, high white group. Went bam, 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 bam. One of the most ferocious explosions somewhere outside. I put on my clothes real quick and ran down like everybody else. We off in the distance, we see the huge fireballs going up. About 10 minutes later, someone got word through the radio or a friend that a streetcar and a double tanker gasoline truck had collided. And there were over 200 people killed. Most of them on the streetcar. You couldn't even tell they were there. It was like a matchstick. But the reason I'm telling the story is we, we would have been on that streetcar and not be alive if it wasn't for me driving a car, an old clunk. And uh, from that day on, Jim Libby, one of my best friends, too, because <laughs> he would have been on that one for sure. There are a couple other close calls. Later on, when I was 46, and I had had, <coughs> uh, was working for the YMCA in Cleveland, and I was an avid golfer. So one day, uh, my pastor and I were out this, right here out here at Royal Press. I don't know whether you know where it is on 82 in Strongville. And <coughs> I, was, uh, I was out by myself stupid guy that I was. And uh, it was cold that day. And I decided to go ahead and see if I could leak it in nine holes. I got up to about the third hole, and uh, I hit one in the rod in the lake. Got mad. Sit down and smoke a cigarette. I was a smoker in those days. Got up, hit another one in the lake. And sat down, smoked another cigarette, and hit one 300 yards and almost landed on the green. By the time I got to the green, though, I was hardly able to walk. The pain was huge all the way along in here. And all of a sudden, I realized I was having a heart attack. 
all by myself. Nobody else on the course that I know of. I ha happened to be at that point where there were five greens and tees that all sort of came together. Maybe you know where that is on the first nine. I sat down. It was, I pulled my jacket over me. I didn't dress warm enough. And I looked over and I could see a guy on a tractor cutting the grass too far away to, for him to hear me. I couldn't shout very loud anyway. If I had walked in, I was a dead duck. I knew enough about the human body to know that I never would have made it. And all of a sudden, off to my left, four little guys came walking out of the fog. And I got up, just able to get up, just to get up and stagger over to them. I told them I thought I was having a heart attack. One under here, one under here, and they took me back and sat me down and on a bench. One of them took hail, high tailed took the guy that was cutting the grass. Within a minute, they had a golf cart out there to haul me in. As soon as I got in where it was nice and warm, I felt better, but I was still in desperate pain. They had already called the ambulance, and within a matter of minutes, the ambulance was there, and I hailed it off to Southwest um, Hospital. You probably know where that is if you're from this area. The next spring, when I was feeling better, I kept asking the doctor when it was time I could go out and play golf again. <laughs> Dummy. Anyway, I thought, well, he says, as long as you stay, you run a cart, you'd be probably okay. But take it easy. So I did, and call up the pastor again, and we went to the same golf course. I really wanted to go in there and thank those people for taking good care of me and saving my life. When I went in at, to talk to them, and I walked up and shook the, their hand one at a time, I said, by the way, I said, where did those four little guys come from out there that helped get me in here? And th they looked at each other and said, there wasn't anybody but you on the golf course that day. Ever since then, I've wondered, were they real or were they unreal? I know I didn't walk in. I wouldn't be dead for sure. And unfortunately, the guy that was cutting grass passed away that year. He was an older man. So there wasn't really any way I could connect it. But I've been back there a couple times and talked to those people, but they still say that I was the only one on the golf course that day. So you can be in danger anywhere, anytime. And uh, I'm glad that you're willing to sit there and listen to me. As I unloaded, I've ta talked about or said too much about these things for many, many years. What started me off again? Uh, I've been a member of the uh, American Legion now for a year. And they just voted me in as their chaplain. Thank you. This is a good part. <laughs> Anybody have anything you want to ask? Yeah, over here. Let me see if I can get it over. Again, we just want to get your question online. Yeah, I'd like to know uh, what division and what regiment you were in. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the easiest way just to come from the top and come down. I was in I Corps, South Pacific, 24th Division, 21st Regiment. 3rd Battalion, I Company, Line Company, was I Company. Uh, you mentioned the Japanese Marines and how especially tough they were. Did you have any direct contact with them, or what, what can you tell us from what other people had uh, said about them that fought them? Unfortunately, it's a sort of a sad story. Because <laughs> Remember I was telling you about the mortars that landed all in between us? Well, right behind us, uh, where we had dug in, there was about nine Japanese Marines dead. Been there for a couple of days. Not something you like to remember. And they were, I'm sure they were. And they're big. Six, six, two, six, four, so on. Any other questions? <coughs> um, 
you said that the sergeant that, uh, on the island told you some things to keep you alive. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? What did he exactly tell you? What were the things that you needed to know to stay I'm alive? Sorry, I, I, you, you had mentioned that the sergeant took you aside since you were an Ohio boy and lived just around the corner from him. Oh, you said yeah, that he told sergeant, you, yeah. yeah, he told you some things that would would help you stay alive on the island. Do you remember any of those exact things, oh, what he told you? You'll be surprised at things that a, a man that's been in combat for two years knows. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know hardly where to begin. Uh, how to dig the hole? Two by two by six? And always dig it, he says, because you never know uh, when a sniper is going to zero in on you. And you've got to be below ground if you expect to stay alive. That's at night, of course. Uh, what we did in the jungles, you only see sometimes 15 feet. Uh, we would clear the heavy stuff out, and then we would dig a uh, perimeter defense. Uh, the two by two by four by six is like a spoke on a wheel. So you could shoot in any direction. And uh, sometimes we did. <laughs> I can remember one sort of laughable thing. You, when you, you go to sleep at night, you leave one guy out every three awake. You also have gone out and put hand grenades back in the box with a pin out. You tie a little wire on them, you go to the next one, all the way around that perimeter. Anything that's out there that trips one of them is going to go boom. And it's a warning, boom. Uh, when that happens, everybody gets up and starts shooting. And the funny thing that <laughs> about this one night, this same Oki guy had gone out to use the restroom. And had, he tripped one of those hand grenades, and he was running like crazy, trying to beat them all <laughs> as they came out of their boxes. Then another time, it was uh, about 3 o'clock in the morning, we had a loud boom, 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 and all, and all those hand grenades were coming out of the boxes, and we all got up and started shooting. The next morning, we wondered what it was that we're shooting at. And we walked out there, and there's a great big snake about that big, <laughs> 16 feet long. Well, nothing but snake, <laughs> snake meat. <laughs> I, can't, I can't think of a word <laughs> to describe it, but it wasn't live, that's for sure. <laughs> Any other questions? It's been a joy talking to you. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Now we'll oh, have no. time. <laughs> I'm go. sorry. I didn't say. Could you characterize the attitude of the Japanese during occupation duty? Any, uh, how they felt I'm towards the GI? That I didn't talk about that because it, it was a pleasant shock, to tell you the truth. Um, I, one little story probably gives you some idea. We got leave and we ran into this little town uh, just to get away from, you know, the, your, your next door snorer. And there were four or five of us walking along down the street, not a soul, nobody, but us. And all of a sudden we heard this clippity clap, clap, clap behind us. We turned around and we could see a little Japanese kids disappear behind a door or behind a, a building. And so we said, gee, what are they doing that for? You know. So well, the wiser the guys uh, in the group said, I'll tell you what, the next time we do that, everybody have a candy bar handed. We carry them around. And he said, we'll offer it to them. And so we heard this clickety clack, 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 and we turned around, and all of us did this, and they stopped dead in their tracks. Any little kid knows what a candy bar is. <laughs> Walks up grabs it and runs, and within five minutes, every human being on that town was out on the street again. <laughs> That's a pretty good idea of their attitude. They're afraid of us. They'd been told that we were the devil himself. Did you get a chance to talk to any of them? Did they, did they hold a grudge? Or I heard the Japanese, uh, a lot of them would commit suicide rather than that's true. And what was their, their feeling of, of shame or when they would 
see you? Did they feel ashamed that you, you won, obviously, if you beat them, or were they just... Well, he's talking about the occupation, away? mainly? Yes. Well, the reason for the occupation being a, a two people, MacArthur and the deity. And they both took, a, took charge of the situation, and the Japanese guy talking to the Japanese, and the MacArthur telling us what to do. And because of that, I don't, I don't remember any incidents uh, of, of sniperism or death or stab in the back or anything. Uh, they welcomed us, almost like he was your brother. I was glad I took that note <laughs> after it was all over. Any other questions? Okay. Well, Tom, thank you very thank much. You. Yeah. You give them to your grandkids. You got more than one? Two. Two? I got a 19 year old and a, and a nine year old. Oh, yeah, that's okay. Uh, the 19 year old has just finished basic training with the Air National Guard oh. and is in Ohio University. Uh, got a four year scholarship, and when he comes out, he'll probably be a lieutenant colonel or something. Oh, like his dad. <laughs>